All right, folks. <clears throat> Breaking news. Breaking news right now. I can tell you, Benjamin Netanyahu says that the fateful hour has drawn near. We're at the fateful hour and maybe the moment of truth for this entire war that has broke out in the Middle East after this brutal attack by Hamas on the innocent civilians of Israel. Let me tell you all about it just one second. Quickly, remember this, guys. Do you want to take control of your financial future but don't know where to start? Noble Gold Investments understands. If you go to www.pastorpaulgold.com or pick up the phone and call them at 877-646-5347, they'll help you. You see, investing in precious metals may sound confusing, but the team at Noble Gold Investment can make it easy. As a matter of fact, here's some what some of the customers are saying. One said, the staff answered all my questions and helped me every step of the way. Another one said, there's no pressure tactics at Noble Gold, just honest guidance. Another one said, securing my future is less stressful thanks to Noble Gold's expertise. So don't settle for financial uncertainty. They'll suggest options and see if you can diversify into gold and silver. And right now, over at www.pastorpaulgold.com, Noble Gold Investment is offering a free five ounces. This coin, it weighs five ounces, pure silver, America the Beautiful. They will give this to you for free for everybody that qualifies with a gold or silver IRA. So don't settle for financial uncertainty. Go to www.pastorpaulgold.com or pick up the phone and call them at 877-646-5347. Well, it's quite extraordinary right now what's been going on in the Middle East. And uh, I was uh, talking with my co-author, Troy Anderson, of our brand new book coming out, Revelation 9-11, which uh, you can get your pre-orders in right now if you go to Amazon.com. It's also at Barnes & Noble. It's also at Books a Million. It's also at Walmart and, and Target. It's, it's going to be released April 2nd. And if you go to Amazon and purchase it there, help drive the uh, ratings up. It really helps us. Um, but you can get it at the other locations as well. Here's the bottom line. We're in now a significant moment. This is why God literally brought me a vision of Revelation 9-11 of Apollyon crawling out of the bottomless pit. This is why it happened. Uh, oh, I really need a cup of coffee, darling. How are you? And so it's really why it's happened. I'm getting ready to do a podcast. I'm going to be on with um, Eric Jajewski, uh here in just a few minutes. i got to do an interview on his podcast, and he, is, he has the largest Catholic podcast in the world, and uh, we're going to be talking about it these current events, and then it will air, I think, within a day or two. But it's very interesting how things are moving so rapidly, so quickly now. And now we have the fateful the fateful hour, folks, the fateful hour. And this is huge, okay? This is huge. Here's what we found out. Benjamin Netanyahu tells his forces that Israel, literally, that Israel— um, is that that fateful hour to attack the Gaza Strip by land, sea, and air? The hour has drawn near. The United Nations warns of a scepter of death as the enclave's hospitals run out of medicine and the crisis threatens to engulf the entire Middle East. Tensions are continuing to rise amid a planned Israeli ground offensive in Gaza. Israel's imminent invasion of Gaza could turn into a, a really a situation that could last as much as 18 months or longer to fully dismantle these monsters, he said. Netanyahu said, bloodthirsty monsters of Hamas. Rainy weather has delayed the full-scale onslaught today, but... Uh, Israel's prime minister vows that the demolishing of this terror group is imminent. We're at the fateful hour. Now, uh, however, the United Nations has warned 
that the scepter of death looms over Gaza as hundreds of thousands continue to flee from the expected Israeli invasion. Supplies of food, water, fuel, and medicines are running dangerously low after Israel imposed a blockade on the Palestinian territory. But today, Egypt agreed to reopen its border, crossing for eight hours between 6 and 2 p.m. Um, that's not to let everybody flow through, but that at least let people who qualify, who have a passport, who are not part of this, let those folks get out of Gaza, some of them being Americans. Now, a ceasefire agreed upon by Egypt and Israel and the U.S. will coincide with the opening of the border crossing and would last for several hours, as two Egyptian security sources are telling us today. So there's going to be about a several hours, a ceasefire. It looks like that border will open up for just a few hours uh, from, from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. to let a few of the folks who truly are not involved in this at all to get out of there. And this isn't none of the hostages. Now, the hostages are hostages. They're being held by Hamas against their will, including uh, 17 Americans of the 199. I guess now we're getting the names of the hostages. We know there's 199 that are right now hostages of Hamas. Um, The Israeli military's rules of engagement have reportedly been loosened for the ground invasion to allow um, fewer checks before shooting. This is why they asked the one million people in northern Gaza to flee to southern Gaza. We understand that 600,000 people have left northern Gaza and have already crossed the river into southern Gaza. 600,000. But that means 400,000 are still not there yet. Part of it is Hamas is not allowing them to go. Thank you, darling, for the coffee. Perfect timing. You guys might want to get a cup while you're at it. So the people, there's still a lot of them that would like to go, but they're, Hamas is blocking the roads, threatening their lives if they want to leave. Uh, so this is going to become a lot of, sh- there'll be a lot of human shields uh, to try to protect the Hamas fighters. Plus, I believe a lot of the Hamas fighters have already are part of the ones fleeing into South Gaza. I, I just can't see these cowards all standing there ready to fight the Israelis. Uh, yeah, they'll, they'll force a few to do it, but I know some of them, are, a lot of them are not going to. Uh, so we're going to watch this very closely as Netanyahu says that the fateful hour is here. Now, Israel has identified two of Hamas's leaders that they are going to hunt down, who they believe is totally responsible. And uh, one's name is Senwar, Yaha Senwar, and the other one is El Dif. Both of these men are behind the October 7th Hamas attack in Israel that left nearly 1,400 people dead. It's Sin War. It's spelled S I N W A R. Sin War. I think you say it, Sun War. He is the mastermind along with El Dif. And uh, according to Ron Dermer, Israel's a minister of strategic affairs and a member of its new war cabinet, he told CBS News in an interview in Tel Aviv that these two people in Gaza, they're the ones who are totally responsible specifically for the nature of the attack. But they are backed by Iran. And they are backed financially by Iran. And they're backed with weapons from Iran. And they're backed with the training of their uh, terrorists. And the logistics. And the communication. And the political support. All of it by Iran. So Iran of course, threatening uh, to bring an earthquake, an earthquake on Israel if they go forward with the invasion. And um, 
I wonder, do they use some kind of weather modification weapon to do that? Is that what they're threatening? Are they threatening a nuclear detonation uh, on Israel? Of course, this is why the USS um, Dwight D. Eisenhower is now on the way. This is why the um, USS Gerald Ford is already there in the Mediterranean. It is why American special ops are being flown in from different bases uh, and being uh, put on standby, maybe even brought in. If I can't speak on behalf of the U.S. military, who they're using or what, I'll just speculate that some of the best uh, special ops uh, teams that the United States has are probably going to help in the invasion, the ground invasion of um, Gaza. I just almost guarantee it. They'll probably be embedded, but I don't know. Do two wrongs make a right? Buzzy asks. It's a great, hey, you know, it's a fair question. No, obviously two wrongs never make a right. Um, it isn't wrong to root out Hamas, who has uh, systematically brutalized their own Palestinian people since 2005 when they were given control of the Gaza Strip and when Israel left the Gaza Strip the Jews said okay you can have it and so that since 2005 Hamas has brutalized has taken all the funds and money that has been brought in all the relief all the efforts by the whole world really for the for to help prop up the Gaza world or a Gaza Strip area. So it is Hamas who has brutalized these people, their own people. And it's Hamas who launched this brutal attack on October 7th. Hamas, who has sent rockets flying into Tel Aviv and into uh, Ashkelon and, and, and Ashkelon and and all the other surrounding communities. If you're saying it's wrong for Israel to go in and stop them, I have to, you know, respectfully disagree. Um, should they just sit back on their hands, Israel, and do nothing and allow Hamas to continue to brutalize the Palestinian people and continue to attack the Israeli nation terrorizing the citizens of Israel with rockets and and building a coalition by the way with the likes of Hezbollah of southern Lebanon with uh, Syria uh, with the Iranians who are fully backing them probably uh, mostly and even with uh, Isis and Islamic Jihad organizations and even the Russians who are one-off using Iran as their proxy. So do it, do, I guess the question is, do you want them to sit there and wait? So now, does that mean that everything that Israel will do in this invasion, uh, you know, it's, it's just going to go, it's going to go so pure and clean and not one civilian's going to get killed and everything's going to work out just great. And they're going to systematically surgically remove Hamas. I think we'd, we'd all have to be naive to think that. We know that there are going to be innocent civilians killed because part of Hamas's military strategy is stick women and children in the front, not in the back, in the front, and to be uh, to be the shields uh, when they go into battle. So it's a fair question. You ask a fair question. Uh, it's never, two wrongs never make a right, but I think at this point you can't, you can't say that Israel defending its nation and trying to free 199 hostages uh, plus uh, plus eliminate Hamas as an organization and maybe chase down the Iranians at the end of the day can't be wrong. That can't be wrong. That is, that's sort of what, what happened in the Bible. Let's just put it this way. The Philistines were, were definitely enemies of Israel. And they one time when David was out fighting the different uh, warring factions against the kingdom of Israel, the Philistines came into the camp he had at Ziglag and stole 
all their wives and children and took them hostage. And when D- King David, he wasn't king yet, he was, a, he was going to be, the fighting general David and his 600 men came back to their camp after fighting so hard and defeating the enemies of Israel. When they got back home, their wives and children had been stolen, been taken hostage. And the men were so distraught, they, they thought about stoning David to death because they said, we've been fighting with you. We've been out here battling every enemy of Israel. You've been leading us, and now you've got us to this point. And we've come home, and our family's gone. And David said, hold on a minute. And David went off to himself. The Bible says he began to encourage himself in the Lord. He began to worship God and began to open up his heart. He began to pray to God and began to ask God, what should he do? God, you've brought me this far, but now my family and all their families are gone. What should we do? Should we go after these guys? Should we pursue this troop that's done this? And the Bible says that God said to David, go, pursue them and recover all. And so David came back and said, I have a word from the Lord. The Lord says we are to go after these guys. We're to hunt them down like dogs. It's to slaughter every one of them and recover all of our family, all of our wives and children. God said go and pursue and recover all. And that's what they did. And when they on their way, there was 200 of David's men that got so tired, was so exhausted, their faith had weakened so much that when they got down to this one brook on the way and they were drinking the water, David said, I'll tell you what, if anybody here is a, 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 too tired, too weary, stay here and rest. I'll take the rest of you and we'll still go get them and we will get your wives and children. We will pursue them. And 200 of the 600 laid down and rested by the brook. The other 400 went with David. The odds were totally against the children of Israel. But as they hunted down these Philistines, they annihilated them. They hunted them. They fought them. They, re- they slaughtered them. And they recovered every wife and every child, the entire hostages. And on their way back with the celebration as they got back to the brook where the 200 were laying there in exhaustion and weak and faith and tired. And, ex- and really, you can't, you know, you have to understand we're not throwing these guys under the bus. They have, are great, strong warriors. David said, here's your wives and children. We've recovered them. And there was a tremendous celebration. The shout of, of joy, the shout of victory. They had recovered all. The Bible says if you find a if if you catch a thief, make him give your goods back and restore you sevenfold. There are certain biblical principles. When you ask yourself a question, what is the right thing to do? The Bible will always have the answer. And in this case, should we let Hamas keep the 199 hostages or should we pursue and recover all now this is a it's a fateful hour and uh, Netanyahu knows that it is going to be dangerous um, it's going to be very dangerous yeah, I, I teach the Bible. Thank you. I'm so glad. There were people saying, thank you, Pastor, for teaching the Bible. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor, for just helping us. Because it is an emotional thing, what we're dealing with. It's very emotional. People are emotional right now. And there's been this also this anti-Semitic hatred of Jewish people. Guys, this thing is a remnant spirit that has hovered over even our nation since World War II, since Nazi Germany. Matter of fact, a lot of the Nazis who were part of the slaughter of the Jews made it out of Germany after World War II and came here. 
and they brought with them the same anti-Jewish hatred. They came here. Unbelievable. Uh, so that spirit, why in the world? I mean, think about this, man. There's 8 billion people. They actually say there's 7.7 7 billion people on this God's green earth. And only 7 million Israelites living in Israel. About 8 million live in Brooklyn, New York. But in Israel, the state of Israel, it's about 7 million. 7.7 7 billion, only 7 million. And yet these 7 million are the most hated people on the planet. And when we ask why, no one can ever give us the answer. They can never explain it. But the Bible, it does explain it. Because out of them, out of the loins of Abraham, came 12 tribes. This is 12 sons of Jacob. And out of the loins of Abraham, there were two boys born. One named Ishmael by Hagar, the bondwoman. She was a maid, a mistress given to Abraham by his wife, Sarah, to have a child with. And then there is Isaac, the promised child that Sarah, at the age of 90, gave birth to. And God told, of course, Abraham that Ishmael, though he be one of your sons, though he be of your seed, he is not of the promise. So he must leave. Take, tell Hagar and and Ishmael, they must leave. For Isaac has been born. He was the promised child. He was your wife's child, your seed. But he said, but because of Ishmael, you are the father of many nations. And many nations will be birthed because of these two men, Isaac and Ishmael. And of course, we know the story of, some of you may know the story of Jacob because you had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So now you got Abraham's grandson, Jacob, who has the 12 sons. And uh, Jacob had a brother. His name was Esau. He was the oldest. Isaac's oldest son. And so he should be getting the birthright. He should receive the blessing. But instead, when he was weary and weak in faith, he sold his birthright to his younger brother Jacob for a bowl of chili, a bowl of soup, porridge. God seen that and said, oh, so you don't, you don't respect this blessing. You, don't, you, you reject that blessing for a bowl of porridge. So Esau lost that blessing as uh, Rebekah, his mother, helped Jacob um, helped uh, actually um, Jacob to even deceive his father so he could receive the blessing. Now, let me say something. You can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have the blessing of God, you don't have nothing. Your money won't sustain you. Your money will not protect you. Your money cannot save you. That is not true blessing. The blessing of God is when you have the favor of God. When you have the favor of God, it doesn't matter where you came from. You could be like I grew up as poor as Job's turkey. Uh, you could come. Uh, you could come from. Uh, you could come from the hills of Kentucky, or from the urban worlds of our cities and neighborhoods you could come out of the hood i don't care where you came from i don't care if you have nothing in your hand if you have the blessing of god on you you have the favor of god you are going to be blessed and that means when you and as you walk according to the word of god you whatever you put your hand to you'll prosper and god said he will use you for his kingdom for the blessing is upon you. 
So we know the story. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob. We know that Ishmael became Ishmaelites. And we know that the Esau has descendants. We know that that became the different nations that now surround Israel. And so all of this was prophesied to take place. We're at a prophetic moment. We're not at an emotional moment. The situation in the Middle East is not an emotional thing. It is a prophetic thing. It is scriptured, the, the biblical scriptures of the Bible. It is the word of God, actually. It's not somebody's writing or somebody's theory or somebody's anti-Jewish hatred or somebody's tattoo or somebody's um, uh, pamphlet uh, or, or some other type of uh, propaganda. It's not, it's not any of those things. It's the word of God, the blessing. And so we stand here today. We stand here today at a defining moment, a fateful hour, yes. And yes, civilians are going to die. The innocent always die in war. It's going to be terrible. No one wants to see it. But what do we do? Do we recover all? Do we pursue this troop that did it? Do we recover all? Do we lay down and let the devil take it? It's quite amazing to me. We're in the end times. It is unbelievable what's happening. Jesus is coming soon. Christ is coming for the whole world. And he's coming after those that are redeemed. Truly have accepted Yeshua, his son, the Messiah. And all of Israel shall be saved, the Bible says. All of Israel shall be saved. I wonder why God, you know, when Paul wrote that, but of course he was saying that those that would call on his name, and there's, there's scripture that tells you that. Every person watching right now, whether you be a Gentile or a Jew or some other nationality or wherever you're from, it doesn't matter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son in the world to condemn the world, but the world to him might be saved. I, I say that we need to pray. For the Palestinian people, 600,000 have been able to get south of the, of the river. And those other 400,000 who are trying to, some are being forced to stay by Hamas. Let's pray for every one of them. Some of them absolutely are innocent to this. And of course, we don't want any of them to perish in this. We also pray for the Israeli soldiers who also are defending their nation and their people and their families. And many of these young men will spill their blood in Gaza City. It is a time of a fateful hour. Let's pray because we know that we're watching prophecy play out right before our very eyes. God, I'm so scared For this crooked generation You even find faith in the earth When you bring down revelation Forgive us now The sins of our youth Worshiping the idols that knew Everything but the truth 
you just have to uncorrupt our minds. Show us now what we still have the time. We need you. Yeshua. Holy, holy, hallelujah. We need you. Yeshua. Holy, holy, hallelujah. We abandon everything to follow you, our King. Gold and silver in the stream. How much will we see before the fire falls? Lord, could this really be the last altar call? We need your blood over the doorposts of our hearts. Anoint us with your fiery love as the praise and worship starts. We need you, Yeshua. Holy, holy, hallelujah. We need you, Yeshua. Angel from Israel, thank you. We abandon everything to follow you, our King. We throw our gold and silver in the stream. I'll be back, guys, with more uh, information on what's taking place. It's very fluid today. It's a very, very, very fluid day. We'll continue to watch it very closely. I got to go now, go and be on a podcast. Uh, I'm being interviewed, and so I'm going to go do that and be back a little bit later this afternoon uh, with more information because things are happening so fast. These two um, leaders, there's, uh, they believe, are being killed, Hamas leaders that have been killed, it has just uh, happened. We know, though, that the two main guys they want, they still haven't got yet. So there's a lot going on. But at the same time, we're praying because it is the most dangerous time on the planet. It really is uh, the most dangerous time the world has faced since World War II. And, um, but it's so prophetic now. It's so, so, so important that we pray and love one another. Even if people disagree about things, we still love one another in Christ. God bless all of you.